Let me try that one more time. This is, the, this is the closing plenary of the conference, and I am thrilled to see so many of you here. <laughs> this is the faithful many here. Uh, let me just introduce myself real quick. My name is Ed Chung. Uh, I am at the Center for American Progress in D.C. It's a think tank in D.C. Uh, my connection to this work is a lot, and with David and the National Network, is um, a lot to do with my time at the Justice Department uh, in the previous administration and before that, uh, kind of in the Civil Rights Division and so forth. Um, working a lot on the National Initiative. You've heard about that. We won't go over it again right now in detail because you've heard a lot about that. Um, and actually, that's my connection here with, uh, with my co-panelist here. Um, you all know him. You all seen a picture of him, a portrait of him in the hallway as well. A very distinguished uh, a portrait. And one in person, it does more justice in person than in the, in the portrait. But I'm, uh, you know Jeremy Travis, uh, former president of this college, currently uh, leads the, one of the biggest criminal justice programs at a foundation at the uh, Arnold Ventures. Um, and then also, obviously, his great work at the National Institute of Justice um, over many years. But uh, we want to thank you for being part of, you know, having this conference. We want to thank David and his team for putting on a really just an amazing uh, two days here. Um, yeah, please, yeah. And I just kind of want to set the stage for this today, um, for this last closing session. It's, it's a closing conversation. Um, the conversation, though, as Jeremy and I were talking about it, wasn't necessarily going to be between the two of us, especially for an hour and a half. I don't know if I've talked to one person, including my <laughs> wife, for an hour and a half straight for anything. So we're hoping that this closing conversation is a conversation amongst all of us um, and a reflection uh, of what we've uh, learned, uh, a reflection of the things that we've heard, what you're experiencing as well. We especially want to hear from those of you who weren't speakers and give you an opportunity to you know, talk about the things that, that you've experienced here uh, and be able to uh, give your voice to, to this conference as well. Before we do that though, we're gonna give you a little bit of time to reflect about what you wanna say. And so we're gonna have these mic people uh, at these mics and uh, we wanna have that conversation. I wanna first kind of turn it over to Jeremy. And uh, Jeremy, you, you opened the, the, the conference here. Uh, you were, um, you've been in this work for such a long time. And I think one of the things that uh, David and the team have been emphasizing is that there is evidence, there is, this is a, a science now. Could you just, Think back and, and take us through what you have seen and how much evidence we actually have now uh, uh, and some of the themes that have been generated uh, throughout this conference and throughout, this, throughout the National Network's uh, work. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, before answering your question, Ed's a modest guy, so I'm not going to let him get away with that short self-introduction. So Ed has been instrumental in this work from the Justice Department perspective and continuing from his work at the Center for American Progress in elevating your work and this work. And at the Justice Department, when the idea that became the National Initiative was just being incubated and uh, the RFP was put out for the first time and a group of us decided that we were going to go for it and finally got the, the grant. That was the easy part. The hard part was really thinking about how does this work fit into a larger uh, portfolio of violence reduction, uh, racial reconciliation, community policing, um, violence against women, because all of the money, if you know how the grants work, the money came from all of those different offices. So it had to, be, had to make sense as a whole rather than the pieces. And this was the guy who made sense out of everything that was happening at the National Initiative and shepherded, guided, oversaw in a, in a, sort of, in a technical sense, but more importantly was the, really the, the spiritual leader of, of that work in the six cities around the country. And the legacy of that work set up for the <clears throat> next administration is that there's now evidence about the importance and the value and the... Um, the progress that can be made by focusing on the three pillars of that work, which was procedural justice, uh, implicit bias, and most importantly, I think, long-term, most importantly, was the processes of reconciliation between police and communities that are disaffected. 
the next 10 years will owe a real debt to Ed for having made that possible because the seeds have been planted and it's now ready for that next generation. So just would you thank him for being here and what he does because that's, that's really groundbreaking work that will pay off when we're here again 10 years from now, which we all be, right? So just mark your calendars. I know, I think Outlook goes that far out. So, um, Jer Jeremy, um, I just want you to know, my parents always wanted me to be a pastor. So for you to say that I was a spiritual leader of anything, I'm gonna record <laughs> that, send that to my mom. She's gonna, it's gonna make her day, so thank you. The part of, of your intro I'm not gonna send to anybody you're related to is you haven't talked to your wife for an hour and a half. <laughs> Let's not send that to anybody, yeah, yeah, that, please. That's, that's just, uh, you know, what, what happens at John Jay stays at John Jay. For Yes, for, for <laughs> you can tell we really like each other. It's kind of fun. So, so here's what we're going to do. If, if, who was here two years ago? It's just a show of hands. So if you... Yeah, David was here. Good. Uh, if, if, <laughs> if you remember uh, two years ago, I remember it vividly because it was unlike anything I've experienced at a conference before, particularly closing sessions. This is when people you know, find the, the early flight home or it's time to go meet friends for drinks. So this turnout is really great. It's not typical that at a closing session you do what we're going to do, which is really uh, community building. There'll be some information sharing, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about how we want to do that, but this is really a community building moment. We talked at the opening, uh, it was David's observation, Carol's observation, that, that this is a family. Carol said this is a reunion of family, or new members of the family coming on, uh, on board as well. And the name of this organization is a network, so we want to be true to that spirit of what has been created 10 years ago and longer uh, in, in David's uh, work on this, on this work, and, and that is to make sure that when you leave here, you feel that connection and you have found new connections, literally, uh, with people who are doing work that will, that will help you. But we also know that connections require substance. It's not just you know somebody, you have their business card, it's really have you connected because they're doing something that's important or you'd like the way they think or they're challenging you. It's also an intellectual connection, I'll say spiritual one more time, a spiritual connection, a connection of, about, about the work. So you feel like this is a group that I want to be part of because that person asked a great question. So you down for that? that, that that's what we're gonna do um, in a few minutes. Uh, but Ed asked me just to reflect a little bit on, so this is, this is just breathtaking. Last, uh, did you say 25 years? I, I said 25, take whatever time okay, period. Yeah, that's, that's right. So 10 years is the national network. 25 years, if you were at the award ceremony last night, is when David and I first connected. I was NIJ director, he was at Harvard, and we funded the work in Boston that led to where we are today. So it is an interesting, um, both personal but sort of mental exercise to try to reflect on, on that journey that brings us from 25 years ago to now. And the first thing I want to just underscore and for those who were active in, in thinking about uh, sort of community well-being from any angle 25 years ago, the first thing I want to underscore is it was a really scary time. I was at the New York City Police Department at the time as a deputy commissioner and general counsel. You were doing whatever you were doing if you were paying attention to these issues 25 years ago. And violence, rates of violence were going through the roof. Rapid rise. Youth homicide rates, Jeff Butts will tell me if I got this right, uh, doubled in seven years. Close? No? Something like that? Yeah? Okay, close enough. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Butts. Uh, and uh, the New York City story was uh, 2,245 people killed in one year. And it's easy, it's easy now to look back and say, oh, of course that had to peak and come down. And this, is, well, this was predictable where we are now. But this is not easy because the work had to be the work. Now you can think about uh, epidemics and this is the way some people think about what happened. The crack epidemic was an epidemic and that, that uh, the, the colleague of mine used to say at some point the antibodies kick in and communities protect themselves, young people protect themselves and say that's, we're not going to live that way. I actually believe that that is part of what happened. But just reflect on the journey that we've traveled as a country before we talk about the work that's being represented here, the fact that we can say with uh, statistical confidence that we now have the lowest rates of violence since the 60s, the lowest rates of property crime since then, and that the peaks that, we're, that we experienced are 
just in the distant past in our rearview mirror, to be able to say that today is just, I still can't quite get my mind around it. And it's hard for me, and maybe for others of you, to go back to that era. Now, I used to be here, I used to interact with young, lots of young people, now I'm hiring people who, when I say you know, what was going on in the, in the 90s, they say, let's see, I was born in 91, that couldn't have been me. But, so, it's just hard to remember it. And I think the crime discussion, the policy discussion, has to reflect that reality. We also have to remember that we did terrible things, harmful things, long-term, life-damaging things in response to that scary time. We're joined by President Mason. Hi, Carol. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I get to hang out with Ed again. Isn't this cool? Right. Uh, Carol calls Ed her brother, so they have a very close connection. So it's, it's just important to remember that not only was it a scary time, and we've, we've emerged from that era, but to reflect on what we did in response to that epidemic, in response to the crime, and go back to the 60s and 70s, it's not just then, but the, the long time ramp up in incarceration that started in the 70s, uh, we have done some things as a country that we should frankly be ashamed of. And we should just say, we have to atone for those errors policy errors, errors in judgment, errors in, in characterization of people and communities. And a lot of what we're doing right now, I think, is, is a reckoning with that history. And so that's, a, that's about sort of where the country has been, where I think we are as a, as, a, as a country, and what the reform movement now is about, in part, is about that reckoning, and there's a longer reckoning that goes way beyond the 60s uh, to the legacy of slavery. But that reckoning with our policy choices is really important. Now, we chose as a country, and I want to say that again, we, through our democracy, chose to be punitive. We chose to ramp up sentencing. We chose to have long sentencing uh, regimes, and it wasn't just the 94 Crime Act. It goes way back before then. So those choices, those policy choices that we're now coming to terms with, that's what we have to undo. So that's the longer story. Within that, we have the work of David Kennedy and the work of the people in this room and the work of the National Network. Now, I'm not objective on this. You can get that. Uh, so I'm going to try to sort of step back from it a second and think the fact that, and, and assert the fact that we are here now able to talk about a science of crime prevention, as we are at this conference, and that we have the strong evidence that we have and now I'm putting on my academic hat, about what works to reduce violence. And so much of that has come from the work of the National Network and its predecessors, is just a cause for celebration. And the idea that you have been able to do this as a gift to the country is pretty profound, and that's neat, and you should just really feel good about yourself. Because that's the work you're doing. I've heard so much while I've been here, I haven't been here all the whole time, what's happening in this city versus that city, this city. And there's this optimism that I'm hearing from all of the discussions today that's really heartening. But it comes from that work. And the fact that we have an evidence base, the fact that we have a, you know, Thomas was talking about, Thomas Apt was talking about his book that comes out next week. There's a recounting of that evidence. David talks about the, I don't know, I forget, the, I always lose track of the numbers, 18, you know, you know pretty rigorous studies. Uh, by, by pretty rigorous, I mean very rigorous without being a randomized trials, but those are coming out soon. So there's a body of evidence that the scholarly community can only applaud and respect at this point that took a long while to develop. So that's where we are. We have evidence, we have science, we have good practice, we have optimism, we have good success stories. The narrative power of what's happening in countries, cities around the country is really um, unstoppable at this point. For me, the question now is how does all of this affect the 2020 debates? We'll find out next week. Who's the candidate who's going to carry forward a funding strategy from the federal government to continue this work? I can't wait to see. But Ed's going to make that happen. <laughs> uh, so that's the, next, that's the next frontier for me, is who's going to recognize on behalf of the country the work that you're doing and support it with the evidence that's now available? That's the question. So as you think about who you're supporting, you think about watching this national debate, and you go back to your jurisdictions uh, after being here, hosted so beautifully by the National Network, and you wonder who's, who's organizing those street level um, uh, you know, campaigns, as it were, door to door campaigns, and who's asking candidates where they stand, 
I get what they're doing about uh, you know, other things that have to do with criminal justice, but this has to be on the agenda. So I encourage you to do that work when you go home. You know, one of the things that, um, I was a political science major in, in college, and uh, I remember my dad asking me, my, my, my parents immigrated into this country from, from Korea, I was born here, and so was, I'm first generation here, um, and when I told them that I was gonna become a polit political science major, they, they kind of got happy when they heard the term science in there. Um, <laughs> And then we were talking about like, oh, well, it's not like biology necessarily. Um, but in terms of the science of what is happening with violence prevention, violence reduction here, I mean, to, to see the evidence that has been shown, I mean, I just want to echo what you're saying, Jeremy, that uh, I think to, to not call it a science would be such a disservice to, to the work that you were doing here. Um, a brief reflection of some of the the things that I've heard um, over the course of the last couple of days. Um, I I'm, I'm really stunned in a good way by the concept of, well, I think what you're, you started out, Jeremy, by saying what we're gonna do here, the concept of community and how many people have both a, a very common understanding of it but a very separate understanding of it as well and how that's affecting all of our work. Uh, I think some of it came out in the morning plenary today, but it came out in some of the other sessions where we're talking about what is the community that is affected and what is the community that is going to come together to quote unquote solve these issues and work together to these issues. I think one of the things that, I, you know, Jeremy and Carol and whoever else, um, if, you're, if you have had experience working in, in the federal government of, of being able to talk to many different communities, not necessarily many different cities and jurisdictions, but communities, uh, and the different things that you hear, uh, it's, it's amazing uh, to reflect on how different parts of the community that live in the same city just do not talk with each other and do not have the mechanism to talk with each other. And that problems that are happening in one part of the city um, are not problems of the entire community writ large. And so I think one of the things to reflect on is what you've heard here about community and what, whether or not, for example, our police, when they are working in communities, are they part of the community or are they separate and apart from the community? And so I think those are some of the things that when I was reflecting on um, what I've heard really resonated and it's, it's some of the basic things that um, would drive this forward. Jeremy, I know that you had some thoughts about how we could potentially um, you know, proceed in getting other thoughts here. Um, I, I wanted to just throw out a couple um, other reflections before, before I turn it over to you to kind of organize us, but one was some, there are some really good one-liners in this conference, by the way, um, really good ones. I think uh, Elder Tony, I don't know if she's still here, but uh, this morning when, she, when David asked her about reflecting on kind of an ideal community, about what she, the kind of idealism and what she was looking for, and she talked about, you know, uh, not knowing what steak tastes like. I mean, wanting steak, but not wanting, not knowing what steak tastes like. And she would imagine that it's just really good chicken. Not, chicken should not be in any way like downplayed. Good chicken is good chicken. But she, like not knowing that, I mean, it just kind of clicked in my, she, the way that she put that, uh, just really, it was a great line that encapsulated, I think, a lot of the conversations that were going on. Just one more um, uh, th thing to, to mention here, um, uh, Lieutenant Carl uh, from, uh, from New Haven yesterday in his conference, he, he said something that I think is just kind of an undercurrent. It's talking about um, when you're doing these initiatives about relating to the community and working with the community, he made an emphasis. He says, we, meaning police, we have to go first. And that to me was such an important statement because I think, you know, working in either violence reduction or building community trust, for the police to, to ex accept kind of a new framing and then go first out into the community and be accepting of both whatever comes that way is such an important um, idea. And so I just want to leave that um, kind of as, as you're marinating on what, what you're going to share as well. But 
Jeremy. Let me offer one, or, one other observation that maybe we can agree on, on uh, how to uh, proceed here. Those of you who are here for the first panel that I facilitated uh, on the stage here uh, will remember uh, the moment when uh, Fatima Mohammed said, uh, this is a movement. And that was a very powerful, uh, for me, saying what, what single sentences uh, uh, stick out. And uh, it feels like that. And so I was thinking afterwards, what, what characterizes a movement? And it's, it's a group of people who have a vision for how something can be better, shared vision about how something can be better, a common critique deeply grounded in their experience of how things need to change and why they need to change, some general sense, and the general is important, of how to move forward, but not necessarily a specific sense, and the tactics come later. But it's just that we have to move forward and we're banding together to do this in common purpose. So this, this notion that this is a movement, and I think that was captured on this stage because I was struck by, well, first of all, you know, look who we had, uh, I'm going left to right, you know, Von Crandall here, we had Eric Cumberbatch, uh, we had Jeff Butts, we had um, Devon Bogan, uh, Fatima, Mohammed, and myself. So there were people who were um, speaking the common language in ways that I hadn't anticipated, and I think maybe David would agree, would not have been as possible two years ago. I think there's something going on that allows people to think that they are in common purpose, that they have a common goal, they have a common critique, a shared critique, you know, with different nuance and you welcome and that, things from different perspectives of we just don't like the way things are, but we have this vision that things can be better, and we're going to work on tactics separately. Somebody will do this, somebody will do that. You know, when you think of movement, who, who does the marching? Who does the communications work? Who's doing the door-to-door -door organizing? Who's, you know, uh, you know knocking on the legislator's uh, door to get, get attention? Who's doing the press work? Everybody's got something to contribute, and we know that we have different gifts and skills, and the tactics, which I think have in the past gotten in the way of the movement, are now receding in importance to the goal and the common, the shared critique that we don't like where we are. Now, different people will have come at that from different points of view, and I acknowledge that this is not all um, you know, peaches and cream, because some of, sometimes we don't like what each other are doing. Uh, we don't like the police are doing this, we don't like what the DAs are doing, we don't like uh, what's happening uh, with the service provision uh, networks. Okay, I get that. But but I think there is this shared sense that underneath that, we know that we want to be in a different place and that we are respecting each other more. I don't, again, don't want to be sort of Pollyannish here. And we're listening to, other, to each other better. And what Fatima said, and she's a health person, right? So she's, she's in, some, in some sense the real outsider here. But she's saying there's, there's some movement. She's seeing it from her, her point of view. So I think there's something that's happening here that's not just the science and evidence which I really respect and, and get, but it's also this sense of shared journey, shared purpose. And, you know, I spoke last night at the award ceremony, and I, I, said, you, I said to the people who are here, uh, you're both pioneers and patriots. You're pioneers because you're out there together, sort of exploring a new, new frontier, trying to figure out what's, what's next and how do, we, how do we sort of capture something, learn from each other, build the evidence base, the next generation, and do the next level of work. And this is what Ed has done with the National Initiative that Carol supported, the race work, the racial justice, racial reconciliation, the reconciliation work, even without race at the center, is really at the new frontier. So everyone's a pioneer. Everyone's out there sort of trying to figure out what, what, what is next. But at, the, at this very fundamental level, I think you're all patriots because you're really working on strengthening the democracy that we care about. So, because we, we, we realize that the country's gone off course. That's the shared critique, understanding, but the shared vision and the, and the awareness that we can fight over tactics, we can disagree, but as long as we keep moving forward, that's a good thing. So I think there's something else that I would elevate as being an important uh, thread through uh, some of the discussions that was really captured by Fatima's observation. So 
we'd like to make this a conversation amongst us now. And let me suggest a, kind of a way to do it. There's going to be, um, well, there are mics up front. Um, I don't know if... Do we have roving mics also, or, or just the... I don't think we, you don't, so please don't be shy. Um, so there are mics up front. We, we want to hear from you uh, kind of reflections on what you, what you have learned and what you have, uh, you know, what you have gained. And let me just try to organize us in a couple of different types of themes. One is when you come to con conferences like this, it is to reflect on, you want to get something new. You want to get a little new nugget that, um, that you can take back and say, oh, yeah, I, that's, that's something interesting, a new piece of information. Uh, when I go to conferences like this, I also want to talk about a, like a city or a place or something like that that really, or a person, uh, a presentation that, that was an insp inspiration and, and it caused me to think. And is there anything that caused you to think and, cha and think about something in a new light? Um, and then finally, if you just want to heap praise on the national network, feel free to do that as well. This is a great opportunity to do that. But I mean, please just raise your hand here um, and the mics will come to you. I want to just point out, uh, as, as you're thinking, and please you know, go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, I just want to, one other thing that I think went under the radar in terms of a little saying that um, Jesse Janetta said today, which was, which was really, I, I'm, the, I'm the one who chuckled at this, Jesse, when you said, re-entry is the gateway drug to criminal justice, to justice reform, to this work. That, that's such a profound statement uh, in so many levels, um, be, because a lot of that, it's so true in a lot of ways. But what, what's happening here when you're talking about violence reduction and prevention, man, that is the hard work, right? That is the hard real on the ground stuff that you all know better than I do, but I just wanted to point that out because I, I think that was a really um, profound thing. Um, so if, it, it, go ahead. Let me just add uh, one thing, a mechanical thing. The reason I asked whether we could move the mics around is that people shouldn't be addressing us, right? This is, talk to whoever's uh, here in the theater. Uh, Ed and I might, you know, throw in a question every once in a while, but this really is community building. This really is. So if, the, if just don't come to the front, stand where you are. And if somebody from the national network, do you work for the national network? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you if, have if, no idea. <laughs> <laughs> if if we can bring the mics around, that that is consistent with this idea that, you know, it's not about us, it's about you. So, uh, but just raise your hand, stand where you are, and. I love Ed's first one. What have, what have you learned, seen that's real an insight? That's one idea, or or are you leaving with a question that uh, that you want to pose to the group? Maybe someone else can answer. Uh, and ideally, what are you going to do next? That's what I'd love to hear based on this. So, yeah, there's the first one. And be sure to say Pittsburgh, right? No, Delaware. Right, the first time. Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Okay, right. Jay Gilmer from Pittsburgh. And uh, thank you for bringing us all together. My primary insight is that uh, I'm not alone out here. There are lots of people doing what I'm doing, even though I just got the new job last week of a City of Pittsburgh Stop the Violence Coordinator, hey, whatever that means. Right. And you are not alone. So, so I would encourage the National Network to bring together the city directors who have this odd title, because this is a space that's new. Before it was just GVI, now we already we have GVI and this. And years ago, that wasn't even, no one was even thinking about that. So thank you for doing that and for creating this field, which is, has, was, didn't even exist really before. It was not recognized as a thing at all before. Uh, one thing that's striking about the audience though this time, this year, is that there's, there's not as much law enforcement. At one point, law enforcement was taking over. Now law enforcement's disappeared. I guess, I'm not sure why that is, but I'm sure you guys have some insights there. Um, I'm also surprised that there are so few black men in the room. I mean, we're all talking about a black, a, a, a problem that affects black men primarily, but there's not that many on the solutions side, but that's really surprising to me, and I'm not sure if anyone has any insights there either. Um, Another, another place for this to go, and I've, I've heard other cities starting to go in this direction, which is law enforcement social work and tying those professions together. I heard some re research being done there. We are looking at it in Pittsburgh. 
that's kind of, it's coming from, and it's not all coming from us, although we like to say we started that, but there, some other people are starting that, and we are now participating in and driving that, driving it forward with others from social work schools that we have in Pittsburgh. Uh, I also heard here, and I was very excited to hear that something that we have started to research has been proven by you guys, which is that attitudes can change by community members toward their police. And we did some very, very basic research, the first we've ever done, to try to see if that was happening. And even among high school students who all started out hating the police at the beginning of a session, at the end, they didn't hate them as much. They didn't like him that much either, but they didn't hate him as much after an hour and a half. So there is definitely um, progress there, and uh, that, that work was stimulated by the national network, and our police did start going to work, and they're doing their implicit bias trainings all over the community, and the uh, trying the racial reconciliation portions, and doing a whole lot of things they never would have done before. Uh, so thank you all for that. Thank you for creating this. And um, hopefully we'll see you at the first meeting of the city coordinators at some point. Thanks. Congratulations on your job. Just to make a connection between these two, that last point suggests that Ed should talk to his wife for an hour and a half. <laughs> uh, please don't that. let that be the takeaway of the <laughs> session. Seriously. We need to... Uh, Listen, you, you, you walked into it. I, I really did. I, I did want to I, um, say one thing about the point that was raised about, um, you know, le fewer law enforcement here. I, you know, one of the things that it, that we're noticing is the intentionality not necessarily to have fewer law enforcement, but also to have more people who are not law enforcement be part of it. So it's not, for, my observation is probably similar to yours in terms of the, the percentages and composition, um, I think, you know, chalking it up from my perspective to an intentionality to make sure that more people who are representative of the community are part of this. Um, I think that was, that's, to me, it seemed intentional. To, to me, it seemed like that was part of the, um, you know. Who's, who's next? Hands up, please. Yes. Carol. Hey, um, we can we can go to the next person yeah, really, really quickly. So um, one of the things that 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 is powerful to me is remembering that conversation we had back at DOJ when we started um, talking about launching building community trust. Though you didn't know that's what we were going to do, and where we are today. And so it's you know something you're talking about one-liners that were good um, when Chief Deckmar talked about that when you're a bridge builder that means you're going to get walked on. But what it said to me, though, is what I said to him is, but, but you're a bridge that means if you're getting walked on, somebody's going across that bridge to the other side to have that conversation. And so what this room represents to me with the, the there's still law enforcement presence here, but the fact that there's more community presence means, and, and community presence talking about how they're interacting with their law enforcement, it means that, that these bridges are happening, that people are making that walk across. And when I heard the, the community panel this morning, you all were so powerful, so powerful in, 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 in getting us to understand and hear, you know, the, again, the, 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 the comment about the stake, um, though I, 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 there was another one she said that, that all of you all said that was even more powerful to me. But this notion of that we're having these deeper conversations, we're taking it to a whole different level, and so that gives me the confidence that this work is going to be sustained, and the fact that we're having this work when we've got no federal support and no federal leadership means that we've succeeded in making sure that people understand that the work comes from us. You don't need federal leadership, it'd be nice, um, but that we can keep this work being uh, continuing no matter who's in leadership. But to Jeremy's point, we ought to make sure that at every level of political leadership that they are hearing from us and addressing these issues and being responsive to us. Hi, uh, my name's Jeff Clark. I'm with uh, DCJS out of New York State. I run our uh, SNUG program for the state. I have uh, almost 30 years in law enforcement before I took uh, this position. And my comment uh, 
Just to address the individual from Pittsburgh, uh, when dealing with the police in this uh, new era, my first comment, and I tell this to our snug staff all the time, the uh, outreach workers, is approach the guys that get it or the guys that are on the teetering fence or, you know, kind of in the middle. Going after the grumpy Gus that has got 30 years on the job, 25 years on the job, has already uh, made his uh, decision on what a crappy life uh, he leads or what a crappy community he's in, you're not going to convince those guys because when I worked with those guys, I couldn't convince them that it was a good job. I couldn't convince them that they were well paid. So my, my first uh, recommendation is go after the soft targets because once you get the soft targets, they're going to be more numerous as they learn more about uh, the community aspect and bridging, as she was saying, bridging that community and police uh, program for the future. And one of the things as a police officer with, with my background, when I met all of the outreach workers that I've hired, I have to tell them I, I was a cop for 30 years, 27 of it, with Rochester Police Department, and they all freeze up, and they all say, oh my God, I, you know, I don't want to work with a cop. I don't want him to be you know, uh, somebody I report to. And I say, listen guys, in 1985, when I went into the police department, the first thing they taught me in, in the police academy was, you go out there and, and arrest as many people as you can that are committing crimes, and that will solve your problem. And I promise you, every other cop that at some point in their career has been told that at the beginning, and at some point in their career realizes locking people up for everything is not the answer because we can't do it. And that as soon as you involve the community one way or another, you're going to find that you can cure a lot more things without having to be uh, the lock them, lock them up for everything attitude. That zero tolerance doesn't work. Thank you. Hello, uh, I'm Dan Stageman. I'm the research director right here at John Jay. Um, I wanted to just recognize uh, that at least today's session of the conference is taking place uh, simultaneously with uh, hearings, congressional hearings on reparations. Uh, and I think there's a resonance there that's really interesting to me because the most amazing thing that I have found about the two days of this conference is a, a willingness to grapple with the tension in violence reduction between violence reduction as social control and violence reduction as community building. Uh, that tension is there, it's real. I don't think I saw it resolved today. Uh, and I do think it's important to make it explicit. Uh, I, I think if we consider violence reduction to be pacification, uh, you can pacify a community without healing it. You could get to a point where you had zero violence in a community or zero homicides, but would you want to get to that point if you weren't solving the other issues in that community that are indicated by social indicators like wealth inequality, social indicators like public health indicators? Uh, the, the list is long. So how do we think of violence reduction in that context? If you are healing communities, how are you healing those communities without simply pacifying them? How are you solving violence as a part of a complex of problems that is really about uh, historical inequities? Uh, and the, the continuing to grapple with that tension, I think, is, is hugely important. And I just want to congratulate David and his staff for really taking that on in the past couple of days. So, uh, Dan, let me uh, thank you for 
making that observation, also note that today is Juneteenth. So this is a time to sort of think about our, our history as a country relationship to slavery, and in that case, delayed emancipation. Um, so the, uh, history hangs in the air when we do this work, and I think one of the recognitions that's uh, been present here for two days uh, is that, uh, that that history should inform our thinking about uh, about crime policy in ways that would not have been a, a um, uh, sort of a, a, a natural conversation in the criminal justice world maybe 10 years ago, five years ago. Exactly what that means, I think we're still working that through, uh, but it, it is definitely part of, of, uh, of, the, of the new uh, reality. And when I said, not just to praise Ed and Carol for the work on the National Initiative, that those seedlings uh, will, that have been planted through the National Initiative will, will bear fruit. Um, I think the work that's been done in those six cities and, and elsewhere, I still think of uh, uh, Chief Cunningham's uh, statement at the ICP, acknowledging the harm caused by law enforcement over the years, and that's been uh, seen elsewhere uh, throughout the, the policing profession and other professions. I'm part of a group of DAs that are now, I'm not one of them, but I'm sort of in, hanging out with these folks who are asking themselves, how do they, how do they come to terms with their role in, in the machinery of uh, punitive excess? particularly the new, the new folks who are being elected these days, and how does that become part of this conversation about reform and, and reckoning, historical reckoning? So I think, th I thank you for pointing that out, that this is a very important part of the work. I think uh, not only Ed and, and Carol, but, uh, but their colleagues at DOJ get credit for starting that work on the National Initiative, and David and his colleagues for working on it, and, and you know, Tracy Mears and Phil Goff, uh, Tom Tyler and others, uh, and certainly the folks at the Urban Institute have done that work. So this this has really, I'm, I'm just very excited about this because I think it has laid a foundation for that next generation of thinking. Uh, another opportunity for the shameless plug for the Square One project where our next round table in October in Detroit will be on violence. And it's not just community violence, but state violence that we're thinking about a historical um, uh, perspective. So that's a big conversation that uh, that um, we need to we need to um, take seriously, and think about how it relates to the work that we do every day. Because I'm, I'm reminded that when I talked about that Devon Bogan, uh, you know, you know lean forward if you remember that moment and said, "Okay, we can talk about that, but it doesn't mean we can't do something today, right?" I love that impatience. Of course, we do something today, but I think the thing we do today is best informed by that historical uh, perspective. I want to. Pose one other um, thing that you can react to. I think the gentleman from Pittsburgh who uh, uh, made the suggestion of a, a council of some sort uh, along those lines. Um, is there something that y you've been kind of an idea that's been germinating in your head about how, what the next steps could be, whether or not it's in your own community, whether it's for the network as a whole? How do you push this conversation forward? We all know the importance of institutionalizing. We all know the importance of consistency, uh, both at, across the country, but especially in your communities. What's that idea that takes this to the next level? And again, the, the idea of making sure that folks that are new to this space in terms of that role, a, a coordinating council that's using that as an example, but is there something else that could, uh, that could push that conversation forward? Um, I'm really not good with awkward silences, I just want you to know. So I, I will start calling out people. No, I'm kidding, I won't. But one of the other things um, while you're, uh, and please raise your hand for that. One of the other um, uh, little nuggets that I heard was um, trust buys you time. I think that was one of the things that was, uh, it doesn't solve everything, but trust buys you time. And um, you know, building that trust within a community, I think, the importance of that is so is so crucial, sir. That's great, thank you, uh, Rory Gagan from the Centre for Social Justice in London. Um, just, I suppose, reflections and then a question of like, what next? So, um, some historical context from our perspective. So, in two thousand and nine, so a decade ago, 
Um, my organisation produced a report called Dying to Belong, looking at the issue of particularly youth violence uh, and serious violence in Glasgow, among other places, and certainly the GVI work that took place there. And it very much built on the sort of the Boston, the Cincinnati kind of other implementations. Uh, ten years on, almost, um, we've published, so last year, nine years on, we published uh, a sort of follow-up, trying to sort of educate and get policymakers and politicians in the UK back onto the kind of train of this can be stopped, and hence we called the report It Can Be Stopped, because we do believe that the violence can be uh, stopped. And certainly that's been reinforced by everything we've sort of heard in the last um, two days. But something certainly we are going to sort of know, I know we're going to go back to the UK and struggle with is, um, well, it's from America. You know, America's, nothing's good in America. Um, <laughs> you know, Trump's terrible, you know, all that sort of stuff will be thrown at us as it was last time and as it, I'm sure, has been in the past. And I suppose what I've been struck by is um, the diversity of the, the representation in the room, so whether it's former law enforcement, current law enforcement, prosecutors, DAs, um, community members, and so on. And for me, I guess, are we doing enough, you know, as a new member maybe of this family, are, are we doing enough and how better might we um, sort of sell, actually, the, the fact that it can be stopped and sell the fact that this isn't just one voice, it isn't just um, you know, the chief of police saying it can be stopped, it isn't just the prosecutor, it isn't just a, a, a member of the judiciary, it's actually everyone saying it, it's people irrespective of colour, irrespective of background. Um, is there more we can do there? Um, because I certainly know that when I go back to the UK uh, and do my best to fly the flag, there will be, um, oh, it's from America. Now, at least we have Swedes now doing this also. I don't know if they're still <laughs> in the room, but you know that helps me too. But, but is there something we can uh, maybe do where, especially in this era of video content, smartphones, all that kind of good stuff, is there more we can do to, to help mobilize and communicate the good work that's happening? You probably shouldn't fly an American flag when you go back, but uh, that won't help. So let's make that a question, see if anybody else has, uh, anybody has suggestions as to who's not in the room. If you're impressed by the diversity of folks in the room, that's great. We had, a, I think, a very astute observation about the uh, representation of uh, law enforcement in the room. I'm not sure how many prosecutors we've had here, actually. Uh, that's, as I said, I'm, I'm fascinated by the newly elected prosecutors and what they're bringing to the justice reform movement. And I'm also not sure how, how much uh, work we've done in uh, involving uh, the, so the victim services community and the victim advocates uh, in this work in the efforts to reduce mass incarceration, particularly those by our friends in the Alliance for Safety and Justice. They've been very effective at organizing uh, victims and organizing survivors. In that case, to say, you know, we didn't want you to send this guy away to prison for 20 years because of what he did to me. We actually wanted you to do something for him and for, him, for me. Uh, so there, there's, a, there's a voice missing sometimes in, in the violence discussion, uh, which is people who are, on, who are on the receiving end of the harms that are committed, uh, who can often be a very important uh, voice and certainly should be uh, respected. So those are two thoughts, I think. Uh, I don't know how many prosecutors have been here. Maybe someone can help me. Uh, because they, they're just an important part of speaking of our democracy, in our country, we elect them, right? So when they stand for office and say, we're gonna do something different, that's, a, that's an important voice to listen to. There's somebody, there's a new, a new hand in the back. We'll uh, hold on Pittsburgh for a second, if you don't mind. Yeah. I think a lot of awkward silences also work too, so. I just felt bad for Ed, but you know, I do a lot of mediation, so the awkward silences are fine, but. Um, my name is Daniel Orth. I work at the Kroc Institute for Peace and Justice at the University of San Diego. Um, had a lot of great panelists from fellow California cities, and I felt like I just wanted to let you know that San Diego was in the room too. Um, at the Institute, I lead a project called the Building Trust Partnership, which supports faith and community leaders who are trying to work to improve police community relations. Um, the observation that I just wanted to make is how great I think it is that we are using so much data and evidence to inform what we're doing. Um, you know, we no longer have to take guesses at what's working, um, use anecdotal things. You know, we're really in defining problems, getting the data to make sure that we understand the problems as we're setting up interventions, you know, relying on best practices and things that have worked. Um, and I just think it's really important that we recognize and appreciate how, you know, 
how much the field is embracing that and and you know making informed decisions based on that data and that research and um, you know my interest is in continuing to get myself better informed as a as a new member of this family about all the different and great research that's out there. Um, so yeah, happy to be here. Great. Yes. Yeah, thanks. So my name is Mike McLively. I'm with Giffords Law Center. Uh, I just wanted to thank everyone involved with putting this on. It's a phenomenal event. I've learned a ton. I've been thinking about movement building, and that concept has come up a lot uh, over the last two days. And one observation just to offer up to the group that I've seen in another context, another national network, which is the national network of hospital-based violence intervention programs in Fatima. Uh, their executive director was here yesterday, had some great comments. What I've seen them do that I think is very effective and that folks in this room should look into seriously is the, the notion of um, working groups, right? Like affinity groups where we're getting together and communicating with each other, not just you know every two years or when we happen to be discussing work we're doing, but in a very intentional way, whether it's bi-monthly or what have you, getting together with folks who are, say, doing the research or policy-related work or practitioners, whatever it is, to discuss what's happening and learn more about what's going on in other places that could be relevant to the work that we're doing. And so just to hold up to the group that we should think more, I think, about creating structures for that where we can get people together to talk about what's going on, but also to actively recruit more people into those spaces. And I think that's how you do the movement building work effectively. And I've seen with that movement, them bring in all kinds of new uh, skill sets, organizations that are sort of on board with the same vision and are now contributing their skills. Um, in, and then not just every year, but you know, every few months getting together. So just wanted to offer that up to the group. Great suggestion. So Jeremy, I want to um, I want to kind of turn some of these questions over to you as well. So in terms of um, you know if you're thinking about what's next in pushing this forward, and um, what are the what are the what are the concrete things that could you know move this movement forward, can propel it? What are the things that come to mind? To uh, put a, sort of a scary idea into the conversation, uh, and that's the idea of money. And uh, I spent some time in Sacramento two weeks ago with a group convened um, at the uh, California Endowment by uh, Jesse Janetta here from the Urban Institute, and uh, we at Arnold Ventures uh, paid for this, this discussion. And it was community organizations that are, are doing... Um, community-level uh, work around criminal justice topics. And uh, I was there mostly as an observer. Uh, participatory justice is a concept that Jesse and I developed and, and wrote a paper on. So I had a sort of interest, intellectual interest in watching this. And what struck me was the, the ways in which these organizations, I felt it here today, or yesterday with our panel, are so important to the work with the capital W, uh, and so under-resourced, and uh, I guess the corollary is not respected for the contributions that they that they make. And at the same time, we have not thought systematically about ways to uh, to support their work, which means money, and. So the, the, the nexus that I'm trying to make in my head is between the other group that some of us hang out with, which is the Reduced Mass, mass Incarceration Justice Reinvestment Group, and just recognizing that's where we put our money, is in prisons, $80 billion worth. And that's where we've overinvested. That's where we you know, have you know, built these uh, geriatric prisons where you have people who are living the rest of their their natural years in prison at great expense to the public. And at the same time, we have these groups over here that are struggling, that are making, trying to find ways to make communities safe and healthy, and are arguably, that's our conversation, a very important ingredient in success at a local level. 
and uh, the panel I just sat in on that had three people named Michael in it and a woman from Detroit, uh, that was interesting, uh, talking about government sustainability. And one of the Michaels, the Giver's Law guy, was talking about VOCA. So there was an interesting conversation. So we have the Violence, Violent Victims of Crime Act, VOCA, which has gazillions of dollars. Carol used to look at this when she was at OJP for victims of crime that nobody can figure out quite how to spend it down and it sort of gets bigger every year because that's forfeiture money. So there's a, there's, a, there's a project here which is bigger than any of us, which is to think with our elected officials, because ultimately they have to make these decisions, about how to sustain the work that needs to be done at a community level. And that requires a financing model that's quite different from anything we have now and some of the, some of the, the I'm put, pointing this way, the folks on the very far left of the progressive movement are saying, well, let's take the money from police departments. So that's sort of, I, you know, I used to work at one of them. It's not the way I'd like to think about where that money comes from. I get it. I'd rather direct that attention to prisons. Um, but there is, this, there is this question, I think, that is the next generation of, of sophistication of the movement as it becomes a, an actual governmental project to support that community building work, which is where's the money come from? And we're not there yet. People are starting to think about it. Uh, what's happened in California is of great interest to me because that's a, excuse me, this Michael, is it a tripling of the money going to violence prevention? So, but it's, but it's peanuts. How much is the total? 30 million. 30 million in the state of, the country of, California, <laughs> that's the best that we can do, and that's good, right? So there, there's a, there's a, there's somewhere a Harvard Business School, uh, Carnegie Mellon Policy Project, uh, UC whatever, what are the graduate policy school project, which is to say, if we can save X number of dollars by doing things differently, and we want to find a funding source for those X number of dollars over the long term, knowing that we would, it's not just money, we would, we would save lives. What does that funding model look like and how would we put that on somebody's radar? And uh, there I was in Sacramento in California where there's all this success through a referendum in changing justice policy, taking something to the public, forgetting the legislature because there's too many vested interests there. I'd love to think otherwise, but taking it to the public and say, we actually want to go in a very different direction and here's how that money's gonna be spent differently. And so these organizations at the California Endowment, and Jesse, you can correct me if I'm wrong, were talking about how they would, there's a, they all have numbers, uh, AB something or SB something going on the, with money coming back to communities. And it was a dribble of funding and they were trying to figure out how they would spend it differently for their organizations and going to their city council and good for them, that's the next, that's what they should be doing. But, but they're, they're really saying that to all of us that there's a bigger project in mind here, which is how to think about taking the money from, uh, from, I would say, the prison system, everyone has their favorite target, that's mine, back to communities to do community building. For those states that are thinking about marijuana legalization, that's another source of income, back to those communities that need community building. And justice reinvestment, as good as it was, in my view, went off on the wrong track to say, how does it go back to criminal justice expenditures? So I think there's something in the, in the works here. I don't know who's gonna do it. Cap. <laughs> here I am, he's gonna do it. I, I didn't even think about it. Ed's gonna do, everyone say yes to Ed doing this project? Ed should do this project, yes, okay. <laughs> I don't like the fact that that gained a lot of applause there. That's not, that's not true. So that's, when, when you ask what's, the, what's what's next on the horizon, I think we can just see that starting to come into focus, which is the sustainability of this work. And that requires money. Uh, so can I just, to follow up on your VOCA money, so more than $2 billion a year has been going back to the states in formula money for the last five, six years. And so one of the creative things that Joy Frost did before she passed away was she recognized, which your wife, Susan Herman, was, is, has always talked about, is that that the, the people who are committing the crimes are often victims first. And so they, we use some of the VOCA money to put out a solicitation and put some, eat seeds and work about, um, we were focused on men at that time, male survivors of violence, and used VOCA money for that. 
you all need to, I, I keep telling people whenever we get, that you don't need to figure out where to redistribute money and take it from someplace. There's new money, millions coming into every state that you need to go to your states and who, who award that money and demand that they think about seeding this work, supporting this work with that money that's coming back to them that's not tax money, that's not gonna take money out of the police or anybody else, um, and, and see the connections. The data is there, the research is there that shows the relationship between victimization and, 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 and crime, and, and look at that and push them to give you that money as well. And I wanna give a shout out to, um to Shante um, and Alliance for Safety and Justice, who's been doing a lot of work in this area, especially when states put up barriers uh, to survivors receiving that money because you know, there's a lot of requirements that you have to participate in prosecutions or you have to participate in, um, in police investigations. And, and the barriers that are put up there, people who are on probation uh, may not be able to get that kind of money. So um, there's a lot of work that, that certainly is being done. But you know, bringing this back to something that you said earlier and another theme that I've heard, in terms of the definition of what public safety is. And I think what, one thing that's really struck me at this conference was, it's something that we've, we at CAP have been looking at, but in broadening that out so that it's not just talking about one sector of government, one sector of society. When we're talking about providing help for survivors of crime, that is a public safety goal. It is not simply just a victim's compensation thing. It is a, it is a public safety issue there. Um, just imagine, just to follow on Carol's idea, imagine a world in which VOCA money is distributed proportionally to the communities that have not just the highest rates of violence, but the, but the greatest level of harm associated with that violence in terms of ongoing trauma, medical costs, uh, family separation, et cetera, et cetera. Imagine that analytical exercise that said that money should be spent according to need rather than waiting for people to apply for it and facing all the barriers uh, that Ed referenced, including you can't get it in many states if you have a felony conviction. I mean, what, a, what a demonization that represents in our society. There's, there's an easy lift. But imagine that we had a, for, a funding formula that said that money should go, go, go to, according to need and the need was defined broadly, it would be a different world. And that money, a lot of which sits on the table, there was some number that came from somewhere where, where Giffords is working, uh, that was millions, billions, millions of dollars. So it, it's not even being spent at all, much less being spent in ways that you know, we might quibble with. Uh, so th that's a great target for, for funding very important work, healing work at the local level. Sure. Uh, I'm Wayne Rollins from South Florida. I'm the uh, uh, coordinator and project manager for the AVI, um, GVI in Miami. And um, what Carol was saying about the VOCA is, is so critical. Uh, what we found is we've been working with um, Californians for Safety and Justice and Alliance for Safety and Justice. Um, and I'm one of the lead organizers in South Florida um, for that movement. And we've been trying to build a capacity of groups to go after the VOCA money. And well, we recently got a new attorney general, but Pam Biondi was the previous attorney general. And um, we tried to build the capacity of groups from the community to go after the money, but found that uh, it was such a difficult, difficult process that um, most of the money went to victim advocates and victim services for police departments and uh, district attorneys, um, in our case, state attorney's office. And they never left those offices. They were, I mean, and, and the people that were victimized, they're not going to the police department. They're not going to the state attorney's office for services. And so, um, you know, we're advocating for trauma recovery centers in the neighborhood um, so that people can begin to heal. Here in South, in South Florida, um, we had the Parkland shooting, and everybody, they, 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 you know, and, and I'm trying not minimizing the loss of life that happened in Parkland. But at the same time, in Liberty City and Overtown and Miami Gardens, we were losing, you know, that amount of people every month. And there was no outcry for them. 
There was no, you know, uh, uprising for them. Um, but yet, Parkland got a lot of attention. Um, and I understand why. I get it. I, I know why they got the attention. Um, but building the capacity of not only the uh, groups that are doing the work on the ground to be able to apply and get those funds, but to be able to also build the capacity of the attorney generals to understand that they need to direct money into those, those communities and need to be, create some forums for uh, those groups to have the capacity to get those funds. A um, Couple of other things. We talked a lot a bit about legitimacy um, and Basically, for police departments and criminal justice professionals, just treat people the way you want to be treated. I mean, after two days of hearing it, that's really what it boils down to. You know, if, if it's, a, it's a woman, treat her like your mother, <laughs> you know? And if it's, uh, you know, men, treat them like your brother, your father, just, you know, and just treat them people with respect. Um, and then the last point I want to make is about this whole idea of community. And I think I've heard a lot of different perceptions of what and who community um, is or are, and I kind of wrote a few things down um, and just to offer it up as a definition, and a community is a system of independent but yet interdependent entities that impact that system either negatively or positively. Any one entity need not be within the jurisdictional boundaries to impact that system. Um, so, you know, National Network impacts Liberty City, although they're here, you know, on uh, 39th Street in New York. Um, the people in the prison, they impact what's going on in Liberty City. A lot of them still shot callers. Um, so there's not only this idea of um, women raising children, boys by themselves, and you know, men in prison are dying um, that are the community, but you are the community, Jeremy, Ch Jeremy Charis. You know, um, David, you're the community. We're all a part of this community. Where if we're making some impact on that system, we're a part of that community. Love the definition. That's great. So, afternoon. My name is Michael Spence uh, from Every Town, and thank you, Jeremy, for teeing up uh, our prior conversation regarding VOCA. Um, my first note is, is more of a macro uh, perception that one, it's very comforting to know that one, we're all in this together, but that more importantly, we're on the same page. So we had this conversation about VOCA earlier and immediately we see a number of people raise their hands because they're also considering the same. I think the first step for our organization, which will hopefully augment everyone's efforts in this room, is identifying some of those nuanced issues that some of these local groups are experiencing on the ground so that we can advise them so that they can build up their ability to draw down these funds. So in addition to attorney generals, we know that some states, they have separate offices that manage these funds. Many local groups can't even figure out who to apply to, or when the, de the deadlines are, or where to access the application. So those are some of those issues that we need to figure out. Separately, the other one you noted, it's frequently going to law enforcement. If you look at East St. Louis in Illinois, who per capita might have the worst homicide issue in this nation, all of their VOCA funds goes to their local prosecutor. These are the sort of things we need to identify and build workarounds and then engage directly with decision makers so that they're aware of what's happening and can work to improve it. And furthermore, as we were talking earlier about the different restrictions, which are real and have prevented many people in need from accessing assistance funds, we know that there are states like Illinois who has put a set aside of VOCA funds for gun violence victims, or in Connecticut, where not only did they do a set aside for gun violence victims, but specifically black male victims, that there are other solutions that are available to these states if they are so interested and inclined. So our role as a nat national group, the Giffords and the Everytowns, because we have the uh, ability to not only identify these issues, but elevate these solutions, we need to inform and arm all of you in this room so that you guys can go get those funds. Because yes, there are billions on the table. And most importantly, in 2014, the cap on VOCA was 750 million. They then increased it between 2014 and 2018, 4.4 4 
billion was distributed to the states from the federal government in VOCA funds, more than three billion of which for violence prevention and victim assistance. So there is money out there. These groups need to know where it is, but more importantly, how to get it. And I think we're uniquely situated to assist. And that's the importance of us being engaged, although as we mentioned earlier, we're a little late to the party. But this is the role we need to be playing, and we're excited to do that moving forward. Thank you. So, Michael Sean, I hope you have lots of business cards, uh, because <laughs> you ran out already. Uh, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll find you. Uh, I, think, I think this is a, a moment of, of national organizing potential. Um, th that's pretty powerful. And uh, I don't know, it's been a while since I looked at this uh, at all, but the, whatever federal restrictions are on the VOCA funds need to be uh, sort of looked at and gather, uh, gather there are also state restrictions. But my, my view is that a, a um, and I'm just, Carol mentioned her, so I'm very much informed by uh, my wife's uh, writing on, on victims' issues. Susan Herman is her name, if, if you know her. Uh, the views of parallel justice is, is that under the parallel justice concept, victims are, in, are owed an obligation by their government to heal, to help in the healing process. That should not depend on the good fortune of federal prosecutors having brought in fines and fees that go into a big pot of money that then fund a government program. If there's a government program that should be funded by government, that money should go to help victims heal. So we now have, you, you mentioned it in, in uh, Miami Dade, is that where you're from? That there are, there are programs that are part of DA's offices, police departments and the like, of government agencies that, that serve as victims. That should be a government obligation, a regular straight up government obligation. To the extent there's additional money made available through, the, through VOCA, that should be made available to helping not just those victims who happen to be involved in a court case, which is the rare victim, that should go to all victims with a priority to those who are otherwise not being helped. So if you do the, if you do the numbers that Carol referenced, a lot of that money would go to communities directly impacted, and particularly to uh, young African-American males who are victims at a higher rate than any other demographic group. So we've just got it, we've just got it wrong. <laughs> we've just got it wrong. It's simple, right? we just got it wrong. We have to sort of think about how to organize it. It's not just helping communities apply for it. It's changing the rules of the game so that these, that money from the forfeiture fund, the VOCA money, goes where the need is greatest. So there's an organizing project, and we have... Two national organizations are going to, maybe we can help a little bit here, they're going to make this happen because that would be a game changer. So this next chapter is to fund the work, to figure out how to fund the work at the local level. Chief. Thank you. Uh, Lou Deckmar, Police Chief in LaGrange. Um, certainly would encourage everybody to uh, pursue federal funding and any state funding, but I also wouldn't let it be an obstacle to dealing with things at the community level. I'll give you a couple of quick examples. Um, like many communities uh, dealing with homelessness and when uh, we recognized that uh, constantly the police were being involved with that issue we called together all the entities that dealt with homelessness now my city is about 30 35 which city you're from again LaGrange Georgia okay. uh, about 30 35,000 and we found that we had between nonprofits faith and government entities about 40 different agencies that dealt with some aspect of the homelessness issue. And so we gathered them together and created a collaborative. Didn't cost us anything, but what it did is allowed those agencies to leverage those relationships in a way that provided services. Similarly, uh, prison reentry. Um, police department uh, sponsored uh, uh, job fair and record restriction where individuals that had been arrested but not convicted uh, were enabled legislatively to have that uh, record restricted from an employer. Um, the problem or the obstacle is at each one of those stages there's a fee. Police department, prosecutor, courts, judges. And so we just called together all the prosecutors, city, state, um, state solicitor, the judges, and the uh, court clerks and said, if the police department agrees to be the ombudsman, would you all waive fees? And they waive fees. In a year and a half, we were able to get the records restricted of over 300 
young men and women, and some that aren't so young. I ran into a, a lady that I'd worked extensively with in the faith community. She's in her 70s. And I said, what are you doing down here? And she said, gets hung her head and said, when I was young, I messed up, and uh, I want to get that restricted. Um, so homelessness, record restriction. Uh, with regard to prison reentry, um, we have trustees, of course, that work for us. Uh, met this young man that screwed up 20 years ago, kidnapping and robbery. Uh, but he doesn't think at 38 the way he thought at 18. And so he's getting ready to get out and needed a job, and we went through the jobs we have at the police department. And the only thing that kept him from a civilian job was an arbitrary requirement that you not have a felony conviction. So we vetted those jobs that weren't sensitive and changed that and became an example to other community members about why you should take a chance on these folks. And I could... Give him a round of applause. I mean, this is just a remarkable <laughs> list of things that you just went through. That's <laughs> the other is about five or six years ago, and I made these comments. You know, the dirty little secret about, quote, law enforcement is social work. 90% of what we do has nothing to do with an arrest. And our officers know that these people need long-term investment in time, and they don't have the time. So they refer it to a case officer who essentially is a police officer, but she's got a social work background. And she has relationships with 70 different partners, and she takes care of folks that need medicine, don't have the money, folks that need food, don't have the money, folks that need a ticket out of town, don't have the money, need help with housing. So she acts as their ombudsman to help get them to those services. And what each of those instances do is it creates a long-term solution for an acute problem that the police deal with every day. And so I would encourage folks not to look to the federal government, not to look to the state government, but look to their community because these problems are going to be solved at the community level. It's great if you can get it, uh, but we've been waiting for a federal grant for now nine months because of the government shutdown. And uh, if you look to somebody else, it's easy to excuse inaction. Uh, most of these solutions are at the community level. There's another sound bite there. Uh, so this, this work uh, that you described, I'm gonna pick one, you had a long, wonderful list. Uh, just a moment of, uh, talking about my organization. So Arnold Ventures has funded work at, in a number of, of cities around the country on uh, new ways to deal with the, the term of art as frequent utilizers, people who are in and out of multiple systems. They're in jail one week, they're in the emergency room the next week, they're homeless. They're, and every, every jurisdiction knows who Jimmy is, right? And he's, he's just down, down on his luck, he's, his life is not good, things are not working out for him. And he cuts across all these systems. And so our play here is with three counties to try to develop a data capacity to understand who, who's, you know, so we can sort of identify them and put cost to what it costs the taxpayers to not address Jimmy's underlying issues, mental illness or whatever it is, because we spend a lot of money on these folks. The police department sees them, jail sees them, somebody else sees them. And so this, me this model that you have of everybody around one table to do some problem solving, which can be about a person or a people or a group of people, if they're identified, and then, then the question is how to figure out what is, that's where the social work comes in or, or, or housing or something, what is the solution to Johnny's underlying issue so he doesn't come back to jail next week? So that, that, that's, that's just difficult work. It doesn't require necessarily a lot of money, but it just requires people to put, to put their minds to it. I, I agree. Sir, we're gonna give you the last comment here today. And it will be brief. Uh, Jeremy, I just want to follow up real quick on the VOCA issue. Um, to your point about changing the rules, I think is really important, and just a little bit more specificity from my standpoint. So a uh, panel earlier today, where in New York State, our Office of Victim Services, in you know, uh, consult and cooperation with us at the Criminal Justice Services, has made VOCA funds available to uh, create a snug, our street outreach program, a social work program in 11 cities around the state, uh, which is a, a great thing, and I think a pretty innovative use uh, of those dollars. Uh, what I would just say is that 
it's did, really that require, did that require any changes, or is that just an executive decision? No, that was uh, between our, our two commissioners and the state agency, and they've cleared it through, you know, attorneys, the whole nine yards. So I've talked to people from different places that heard that, and I think, again, a very innovative, and because it's victimization in what we're dealing with, with street shootings and such. But the point I make here, and I'm trying to make is a little bit more specifically, is that, and I'm also a retired police officer, 25 years in Rochester, um, working for DCGS for the last five years, the police control this money. The police control this money that goes out. If you do, there's, you, if you do not cooperate with an investigation, the police can shut that down as far as the people getting access to the money. So when we talk to these issues of legitimacy and police community relations and all these different you know, issues that are very relevant and we're all actively here working on, I think that even a specific example, even outreach worker, um, and we know that people don't cooperate with the police for many different reasons, which we, we all know we don't need to talk about. But the point is, even in an outreach worker, um, trying to you know protect himself, his uh, credibility in the neighborhoods, and what we're paying these people to go out and do, um, we run into issues there with cooperation at a local level with a police investigation, which can prohibit them from even getting access to these funds. So I just wanted to break that down a little bit more specifically from our standpoint um, and what that means when you have a huge pot of money potentially available nationally. Um, it's something to be considered. So thank you. And this was a fantastic conference. Thank you all. Every, every time you put this together, <laughs> National Network, thanks. So are we ready to wrap up? Uh, any last words from you, Jeremy? Um, uh, I think the last words come from David. Yeah. Could I get all the national network folks up here, please? And from back behind the curtain, and let me gently usher you off the stage. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Just array yourselves behind me. So while my folks gather, um, I'm going to make the observation that at the end of the process of putting on a major event like this and then doing it for two days and getting about four hours of sleep a night, it's a really good time for a lot of big new ideas. <laughs> um, what I know is that we will... we collectively will take that on. Um, and what I know is that this, this is, in, in my experience, uniquely a group in which big ideas are not just big ideas and people go home. Um, in my bleaker moments, I say to myself, an advocate is somebody who wants somebody else to solve the problem that they care about. That's not this world. This is a world that takes responsibility for solving the problems that it cares about. And when people have notions like this in, in this community, people act. So this was really helpful. Um, I want to thank Jeremy and, and Ed for doing this. Um, we've never done this before. And it worked, and we do a lot of things we've never done before, and they work. So thanks for adding to that string. So this is when people like me usually say thank you to the people who made this happen. That does not feel remotely appropriate this time. Um, I have been at every national network conference. They've all been really, really, really good. Um, this one somehow has risen to a new level. And I think everybody who's, who's, who's been here has felt that. 
So I'm going to try to do something a little bit different here. Um, we have all done this. What, what you have just experienced and participated in was designed and executed, thought through, mapped out, uh, populated, um, theorized, designed, painted, drawn, fed, watered, transported, um, and I don't even know yet all that went wrong that never really showed up, um, by the national network. While the national network did its regular jobs. So this has been pretty remarkable. Um, the person most responsible for this uh, was and is Veronica Dunlap, our Director of Strategic Operations. Strategic Initiative. And what not everybody here knows is that for a long time, Veronica was a professional dancer. Which means, though I never witnessed this, um, I know that at the end of many performances, Veronica did what professional dancers would have done and came center stage and took a bow. I have been to other performances, and I, th I, I think the way this is done is that the, the star stays at center stage <laughs> and is joined by other performers. So come on back. <laughs> Next most responsible for what you have just seen are Tia and Tristan. One, two, three. <laughs> and then there was the rest of us. Come on up here. <laughs> One, two, three. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>